Welcome to Catholic Feedback. I'm your host, Keith Nestor. On this podcast, we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith with everyday life. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Down to Earth Ministry, a ministry of stewardship, a mission of faith, and by the generous support of our patrons. For more information, please visit downtoearthministry.org. That's down, the number two, earthministry.org. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Catholic Feedback. This is the podcast where we connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith to everyday life. And today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking with a good friend of mine, Mr. Michael Lofton from Reason and Theology, about his new book called Answering Orthodoxy. And Eastern Orthodoxy is something that a lot of people that are coming into the Catholic Church, we might not be like completely aware of the differences between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, but there are some significant differences. And what we've seen lately oftentimes are people who who struggle with things in Catholicism and find that Eastern Orthodoxy might to them seem like a better alternative because you don't have issues with the papacy or you don't have certain authoritative issues or different things with liturgy. And for a lot of people, they look at Orthodoxy and say, well, hey, it's as old as Catholicism, right? So why not do this over that? But I think that we need to look deeper into this before we just assume that the grass is always greener. And there's probably not too many people better to talk to about this than Michael Lofton, because he spent time as an Orthodox person. And of course, he's now Catholic, and he's written this incredible book called Answering Orthodoxy. And I'm really excited to to speak with Michael, who's become a good friend of mine. We got to hang out uh, a while back when we stopped through and visited Michael and pray the rosary. So Michael Lofton, Reason and Theology, welcome to Catholic Feedback. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, Keith. Yeah, it's really cool um, getting to talk to you again. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. I think it was our trip about a year ago where we left to go down to Texas. And we, you know, I mean, we if you watched uh, our Instagram, you saw the rosary van broke down in the middle of nowhere. And we just happened to stumble into this, this, shed which was your studio right that that was a pretty epic uh (laughs) epic skit that we did there right (laughs) yeah yeah it was that was kind of fun but uh no we got to spend some time together and and uh you prayed the rosary with the rosary crew and and we did some live streams on your channel and just just got to hang out and you know your your history with with orthodoxy i think is is pretty interesting because when you know when i became catholic to be honest with you i i wasn't aware of this back and forth with orthodoxy and Catholicism that exists for a lot of people in terms of their wondering what the true church is. And I, I've never been a guy who wants to pit one against the other. You know, I've, I've liked to kind of to take, you know, Pope St. John Paul's perspective of the two sides of this, you know, the left lung and the right lung and, and think about what we have in common. But we've also seen two people, and I've experienced this personally, Michael, people who will attack Catholicism and say that Catholicism is is in error and heretical and that all Catholics need to become Orthodox because Catholics aren't in the true church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, I'm kind of more of a defensive player and I've had to look into these issues and, and try to understand a little bit more about why we're Catholic versus Eastern Orthodox. And not only are we going to talk about that in your book, but Tell us a little bit about your own journey when it comes to Catholicism and orthodoxy. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting subject. I um, probably have been studying the differences between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy for maybe at least 12 years now, for a while, um, at least going back to 2011. Um, where I have, well, I suppose it would be 13 years now, right? Um, where I'd ha- I had to ask the question, okay, should I become Catholic or should I become Eastern Orthodox? Because I was coming from a Protestant background. Um, and so that question was on the table and it forced me to have to ask questions like, okay, well, is there historical precedence um, for the papacy in the first millennium? And if so, okay, well, what is the... Eastern Orthodox response to that evidence and, you know, okay, well, the Orthodox are saying this, what is the Catholic response to that? It really just forced me to work through those issues. And this, this book answering Orthodoxy is kind of a product of, 
um, just years and years of wrestling through these issues. But, um, you know, long story short, I became convinced that um, I needed to go from Protestantism to Catholicism because of the historical merit for the papacy. Um, and I became Catholic in, in 2012. But for the next five years, I, I struggled with a lot of things that I saw in the Catholic Church, not so much theologically, but more practical problems that I encountered, scandals that I saw, bad experiences that I had. And a lot of that made me ask the question, well, maybe, maybe I made the wrong choice. You know, maybe I don't see it intellectually, but maybe this is God telling me, okay, well, you're convinced of Catholicism on paper, but I'm showing you through your experiences that you made the wrong decision. You know, that, that's kind of the questions I was uh, entertaining. And after several years of discernment, I ended up going uh, to Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, and I had a great experience in Eastern Orthodoxy, very, very different than what I had experienced in Catholicism with some of the practical concerns and scandals that I experienced. So I had a great time in Eastern Orthodoxy. I didn't really uh, experience any personal scandals or I, I wasn't, uh, you know, treated poorly or anything like that. Um, but the question of, okay, but where is the truth to this matter? Is it, uh, is it in personal experience um, or is it in something objective? You know, um, and I'm the kind of guy who has to concede, okay, well, something is true not based on my experience but because of objective reality right i mean i could have a great time in catholicism that doesn't mean catholicism is right i could have um you know a horrible time in eastern orthodoxy that doesn't mean orthodoxy is false personal experiences don't necessarily determine where the truth is i mean a person could have a great time as a protestant that doesn't necessarily mean Protestantism is true. So I had to really just kind of bring myself back to the question of, okay, well, where, objectively speaking, where does the data lead me? And, you know, having had some time and distance emotionally from the scandals that I experienced, um, I was able to just kind of recenter my thoughts back to, okay, well, what does the evidence show me? And what th one thing that really pressed on my conscience was not only the support for the papacy historically, but also the words from the sec Second Vatican Council from Lumen Gentium where in paragraph 14 it notes uh you cannot be saved if you know the church um the catholic church was established by jesus christ and you refuse to enter or remain in it that last part remain in it really pressed on my conscience for a long time and so it just still urged me to reevaluate this situation continue to look into the evidence and after just several more years of doing that i just realized look i i can't get around the fact that the historical record um teaches that the catholic position on the papacy is right i, I can't shake that and even the sources that orthodox accept such as their own ecumenical councils concede the doctrines the catholic doctrine of the papacy and one thing that i had to do when i became orthodox was um make a profession of faith i did not have to reject catholicism by the way i was never asked to renounce really your catholicism now some jurisdictions would require that of you i was never asked to renounce catholicism or the papacy but i did have to make a profession of faith to affirm the seven vatican uh, seven ecumenical councils not seven Vatican councils, seven ecumenical councils of the first millennium. Um, and of course, I, I did make that profession. I, I mean, Catholics and Orthodox share that in common, so I have no problem making a profession of faith in, in those councils. But okay, I make this profession of faith, and the more I study the historical record, some of these ecumenical councils that I professed teach the papacy and teach the Catholic understanding of the papacy in ways that are irreconcilable with how the Eastern Orthodox currently understand them. And so in light of things like that, I just realized, look, I cannot in good conscience remain estranged from Catholic communion. And so I was reconciled to Rome um, and uh, have not regretted that 
that decision and i finally kind of found a place of peace and uh it came to a point where I, I believe i've i've been able to draw some conclusions after years and years of study so you became or i would say this you became catholic and you st you were catholic and you left because of your bad experiences but then you be but then you you had great experiences in eastern orthodoxy but then you left despite of the fact of your great experiences in eastern orthodoxy and your bad experiences in catholicism because of one of your and i think this is we could talk for hours about just this one point it's not about our personal experiences because like you said that could you know there are all kinds of people that have all kinds of great personal experiences and everything but that's not a question of what that doesn't mean what's true right and I, I hear from people all the time, and probably you do as well, that are Catholic, that are having bad experiences as Catholics. So they're therefore looking for another place where they can have a better experience, whether that be Protestantism or whether it be Eastern Orthodoxy or whatever. And we're not here to judge people's experiences at all. I'm, I, I never argue with somebody when they say they had a bad experience as a Catholic or a good experience as a Protestant, because I totally get that. Yeah. That's not the issue. The issue is what is true. Yeah. What is true? And you, through your study um, and your own journey, came to realize that Catholicism was true. So you had to come back, even though maybe it wasn't going to be the best experience. Um, but I, I think it's interesting you said that you haven't regretted it ever no. since. What is there anything like practically different about your experiences now versus the first time? Not substantially. Yeah. Um maybe some of the more immediate things that I saw that scandalized me or aren't necessarily as pressing, but, um, no, not nothing substantially. Um, I still see some of those same, <laughs> uh, issues that, you know, cause me to have concern. But uh, again, at the end of the day, the question is, um, where does Christ want me to be? And I have to answer that question by, well, what church did Christ establish? <laughs> well, I can't answer that question with, practical experiences that's the wrong tool um because again practical experience one might conclude protestantism is true you know i i had a pretty good time as a reformed baptist <laughs> with some of my presbyterian you know communities around here i i liked them so <laughs> but that doesn't mean that presbyterianism is true right so to answer that question, uh, which church did Christ establish and therefore which church should I belong to, you have to analyze things objectively from, you know, the historical and theological record and uh, just can't shake that <laughs> Catholicism is what it boils down to. Yeah. Well, let's let's kind of talk about this book then, Answering Orthodoxy, A Catholic Response to Attacks from the East. And I, I think that just... That whole thing, like, it, you know, it kind of caught me off guard a little bit because I've had kind of two experiences with orthodoxy. And I should say with orthodox people, I've never been to I've never been to a divine liturgy. I've never I've never worshipped with an orth, with orthodox people. But I have I have a friend who was actually one of my youth group kids when I first became a youth pastor. He was one of our students and he became a Greek orthodox priest. And when I when I I got to see him a couple of years ago after many many years of not seeing him, and I've kind of stayed in touch with him a little bit and seen his family. And he was he's he's a man of faith. He loves the Lord. His his desire is to serve God, and he has like this this just beautiful peaceful spirituality to him as a result of his orthodoxy. That you know it makes me just think, wow, this this man is a brother in, in faith. But then at the on the other side of the spectrum, and I guess you could say this about anything. I've seen these, you know, these Orthodox people mostly online, but I've had a few encounters personally that have just this bitter um, spirit of of division, and they just want to attack Catholicism. Like that seems to be the whole purpose of their of their faith is to talk about why Orthodoxy is right and Catholicism is wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a question of. Well, let's talk about some of these different distinctions of what it looks like to live as an Orthodox Christian and what it looks like to live as a Catholic Christian. It's, it's, it's these attacks that come against us as if Catholicism is some evil, um, you know, horrible thing, and Orthodoxy is this perfect world. So, I think I think this idea of of attacks, we you know, not every Orthodox person is going to attack you for being Catholic, but there certainly are plenty that will, at least 
that you see online. So, um, has, and I think that's been your experience too. Very much so. And, and it goes both ways. There are some really awesome Catholics, very holy people. And then there's some really concerning, troubling Catholics out there. Uh, there are some Catholics out there who um, are very friendly towards Eastern Orthodox. And then there are some others who are very hostile to the Orthodox. And so it's it's kind of the exact same thing. We, we have that in Catholicism as well. So, yeah, there's some Eastern Orthodox people, very holy people, very good people. Um, and would not be interested in attacking Catholicism. Then there are some Eastern Orthodox that are very much interested in attacking Catholicism. And so at the end of the day, um, we need to respond to the theological objections. And so that's kind of what I do here. Theological objections that would attack Catholicism and say that we have um, heretical doctrines, uh, that we have you know, ahistorical positions, that's what I'm engaging yeah. here in the document. So your so your book isn't necessarily like a book that says, "Hey, we're going after Orthodox mm -hmm. people and trying to convert them." This is a book that's like a defensive book, saying, "Okay, well, here are the answers to the things that you guys are bringing up to us about why we're so messed up." And you know, so for for me, I feel like that 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 rings true with me because that's kind of kind of how I want to operate anyway. I don't want to be attacking people, but I'll respond to those attacks all day long, you know. I think we need to be able to have those responses. I remember I had a person say to me one time, "Well, why would you leave the ancient church of Eastern Orthodox to become, you know, Catholic?" Mm -hmm. And I remember just feeling like that's not how I look at it at all. Right. So, um Let's talk about then how you chose these objections and what some of them are in your in your book uh, and how you go about writing a book like this. Does it come from personal experiences of the things that have come your way or where did you where did you come up with these different answers and the attacks? Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. I mean, so, I mean, there's about 30 objections in, in the book to Catholicism, and I, I respond to each one of them. And not only do I respond to them, I also show that the thing that they are objecting to is actually found in many cases in their own Orthodox tradition. So it's an inconsistent argument to really use against Catholics. Um, but what I do is um, I, I've, I've, of course, looked at all of the objections that I've seen you know, over a decade now uh, from the Orthodox position, you know, what are the most common objections? Yeah. And I gave, you know, the top 30. There, There's others, of course, but I just kind of give the most common ones you're going to encounter. Just kind of like you find really common ones with Protestantism. You, sure, you know, sure. You hear it every day. You Catholics worship Mary. <laughs> you know, why do you pray to the saints and not to God? It, you know, there's just some basic stuff that you just hear over and over and over why purgatory you know well it's the same thing with eastern orthodoxy you tend to hear the same stuff over and over and over and so i just gave the most common ones well let's let's talk about a couple of them and i, I think i like how you divided the book into into these different categories mm -hmm. because it's not just it's it's not just helpful to just throw out random things i mean sure. so you, part one is doctrinal attacks Mm -hmm. the, the type of things that, you know, re mostly are going to revolve around the papacy and the filioque, um, some things with the Immaculate Conception. Um, and and I think I think that was pretty interesting. And then mm -hmm. part two, historical attacks, yeah. where people are going to debate on objective history, uh -huh. which you would think would be the easiest thing to deal with because you're talking about objective reality. But I find that's the toughest one because <laughs> people – put forth these these historical records and then they import their meaning upon them mm -hmm. but you can argue about the same exact thing with the same exact source yeah which, <laughs> that's is, which is very frustrating <laughs> that's true that's probably the most difficult is is hashing out the historical record yeah and then part three is liturgical attacks which of course this you know, this boils down to, and, and, you know, you find this, this kind of discussion, even within Catholicism about, well, you know, the liturgical abuses that happen in the church must prove that Catholicism isn't true. So we either need to, you know, become state of a contest or we need to become, you know, you don't hear a lot of Catholics saying we need to become Protestants, but they, they may say we need to become Orthodox or sure. something with a better liturgy or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's, let's just kind of, I'm and I'm just going to put you on the spot, brother. I'm just going to take one let's of these and, 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 and let's from do each it. of these categories. And I want to kind of just have you give a summary of your answer here. Mm -hmm. So from the first one, the doctrinal attacks, I, mm -hmm. I think that, that the biggest doctrinal attack that you're going to hear about 
from from Eastern Orthodoxy, of course, going to define everything is the, is the doctrine of of the papacy, the universal sure. jurisdiction of the successor to Saint Peter over the entire church, because everything rises and falls on that. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you've got basically three chapters in here. The first one is Jesus is the head of the church, not the Pope. That's an mm -hmm. attack. The second one, papal infallibility makes ecumenical councils obsolete. And number mm -hmm. three, every bishop is a successor of St. Peter, not just the Pope. I've heard, I've heard some Protestants make that case as well, but mm -hmm. let's just start with the first one. Jesus is the head of the church, not the Pope. Um, and of course that's, that's given not to, I mean, the Catholic church doesn't argue that, you know, of course, Jesus is the originator of the church, but we will say that the Pope is the visible head of the church. That's that's a fundamental doctrine of Catholicism. So how do you how do you go about answering that objection? Well, you made the important distinction right there, visible head, right? <laughs> so if we if we make the appropriate distinctions, we can make sense of this. But if we don't, then that argument argument might actually sound persuasive because I mean, who wants to deny that Jesus is head right. of the church? Of course he's the head of the church. <laughs> so here's the thing. All right. If you look at Eastern Orthodoxy, who do they say the head of the local church is? Well, the local bishop. Uh-huh. Well. Uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy, is not Jesus also the head of the local church? Well, of course he is. I don't know any Eastern Orthodox who would say, no, the bishop is the head, not Jesus. <laughs> they would say it's a both and, not an either one. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now you have to make a distinction between perhaps a visible versus invisible head. Jesus being the invisible head, the bishop being the visible head. Sure. Okay. So now apply that on the universal level. Um, Catholics will argue that the Pope is head of the church, but the visible head, not the invisible head. Now the question is, okay, well, the distinction makes sense, but is there merit for that historically? Yes, there is. In fact, um, four of the ecumenical councils that the Eastern Orthodox accept specifically call the Pope the head of the universal church, the head of the churches of God. Uh, various expressions are used, but it concedes that he is the head now, obviously, it's a visible headship, not replacing Jesus as the head. Um, so what I do is I make the appropriate distinctions, but I also show how, again, the objection from Orthodox is short-sighted because if what they're saying is true, it undermines their own ecclesiology on the local level. Um, so it's just a really bad argument to employ, but it might be the number one objection that mm. I hear uh, from the Eastern Orthodox. So practically speaking, from the standpoint of, of Eastern Orthodoxy, who is in charge? Mm. On the local level or universal level? Universal level. I mean, I think we all understand the local level, you know, there's going to be bishops and, and, you know, but just kind of for people who don't know, kind of explain sort of the, the flow chart of leadership in Eastern Orthodoxy. Well, they wouldn't have one person who's specifically in charge on the universal level. They would, um, they might appeal, some might appeal to ecumenical councils, so groups and bodies of bishops. Uh, others might appeal to what's called pan orthodox synods, which, um, you know, there's a whole debate on how to distinguish those between an ecumenical council. One, one of the problems here is orthodoxy doesn't have a way to really define what an ecumenical council is and therefore what a pan-orthodox synod is and so um you know they, they would generally appeal to groups of bishops though on the universal level some might point out well there does there is this unique role that the patriarch of constantinople has but it's not like the papacy you know with the papacy the pope can interfere in the affairs of any bishop he can immediately interfere um, however, in Eastern Orthodoxy, the Patriarch of Constantinople can't like go into uh, the territory of another bishop and tell the bishop what to do. He might have some kind of appellate uh, rights, so bishops could appeal to him. Perhaps they could appeal to the Bishop of Constantinople over their local synod, and um, but even that might be contested by some. Well, let me also mention uh, synods here. What you do have is in Eastern Orthodoxy at the local level, you have the bishop. Above that, you tend to have a synod of bishops who is um, uh, that synod of bishops is generally led by a head, 
of the synod, sometimes a patriarch. Um, but that patriarch doesn't have like full supreme authority over everybody in the synod and all the bishops. Uh, but the synod can make decisions like removing a priest or removing a bishop who violates canon law. Uh, so they do have some authority as a collective body, but not like supreme authority or anything like that and so that tends to be the top level for most eastern orthodox churches there's depending on how you count them 16 or 17 of them each led by a synod of bishops but again above that level that that middle strata that middle tier of the synod above that there really isn't anything again some might argue an ecumenical council but the problem is Orthodox can't determine what an ecumenical council is and haven't had one in 1300 years. And so you start to get to the universal level in Eastern Orthodoxy, and that's where you find massive debates and there just isn't settled doctrine there. So at the Synod of Bishops, is that, would that be made up of the different patriarchs of each of each of the, the churches? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the patriarch is generally the head of each Synod. There are some exceptional cases or one might not have a patriarch, but in most cases they do. And so the patriarch would be the head of the synod, but he does not have like supreme authority like the Pope would. Um, whereas, you know, again, the Pope can yeah. interfere in anybody's, the patriarch doesn't have that kind of power. So you at the top, you've got the, you've got the patriarchs and Constantinople sort of has this, this interesting, you know, place of, 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 honor. I don't want to say authority, but a place of honor. Yeah. And then from there down, you have um, each of those patriarchs is the leader of a synod within their within their. They're the I don't head know of what the you synod. want to call it the, of, the, of their like. What do you call the difference between like the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian sure. Orthodox Church? Do you call them like their churches, or do you call them something yeah. else, or what? They're autocephalous churches, so they sure. are called churches. So they're, they're churches. Uh huh. And, and so then the underneath them, you have the. Is there another layer between them and the individual priests? Is there like a kind of like a diocesan bishop level kind of a thing? Yeah. yeah there. So so you have the. Um, so let's let's go with just like one autocephalous church, uh, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, right? So you would have one autocephalous church here, um, headed by the patriarch. Uh, who's the head of the Synod of Bishops. Beneath that, you have the individual bishops who are over their uh, dioceses. And then, uh, of course, underneath that, you have like priests, deacons, laity uh, for each local diocese, each local church. Um, so very much like the way it is in Catholicism. Now, in the Latin rite, you don't tend to have synods uh, or synod of bishops. You might have Episcopal conferences. And they're not exactly the same, uh, but you do have in some of the Eastern Catholic churches or most of the Eastern Catholic churches, synods of bishops and then a patriarch. And so the Eastern Catholics are structured pretty much in the same way as Eastern Orthodox there. The only difference is with Eastern Catholics, we also have Pope at right. the head of the top of, you know, so he, he, there's that extra layer even above the synod of bishops, whereas in Eastern Orthodoxy, there isn't a Pope at that extra layer. So what's there? Yeah, that's what, the question. What holds them together? What binds them together? And that's where you start to find a lot of different views, massive debates. In fact, there's a whole schism within Eastern Orthodoxy right now over this issue. Right now, the Russian Orthodox Church, um, and especially the patriarch there, does not recognize communion with Constantinople and the patriarch of Constantinople. And so there's a dispute right now in Eastern Orthodoxy and a schism right now over the very question of what is the role of the Patriarch of Constantinople? What kind of role does he have? What kind of authority, if any, does he have? There's a debate there. And Constantinople is saying one thing. Uh, Moscow is saying something else. Right now, Moscow has broken communion over this issue. So it's a massive debate right now in Eastern Orthodoxy. So to say, well, Jesus is the head of the church, not the Pope, from a practical perspective, that doesn't solve a lot of things for the for our Eastern Orthodox friends, because when they have those disputes at that level of patriarchy, there's nowhere to go. Right. 
So when you, you know, just from a reality perspective, when people say, oh, it would be awesome if there was a reunion between the East and the West, there's really like you could have and we have had in the past, you could have some of these churches that have come back into communion with Rome, but there's not one guy who gets to say representing Eastern Orthodoxy, okay, we're, we're going to do this because yeah. let's say that, let's just say the Patriarch of Constantinople for whatever reason mm -hmm. said to, to Pope Francis, okay, let's get this figured out. And those two guys went in a room and they sorted it all out and they came out and said, we've reunited the East and the West. Now for Catholics, that's binding, but for, for Orthodox, that would that would be a problem because you you might have other other bishops or other patriarchs besides the the patriarch of Constantinople who are going to say you don't have the authority to do that for us you mm -hmm. can't reunite us that could just only apply to you know Constantinople or whatever yeah. um, that's the reality isn't it that's There's the reality no one person who speaks for for everyone yeah not only would you have bishops within the church of the patriarch of Constantinople within his jurisdiction not only would you have people who break away from him who don't agree with it but all these other autocephalous churches most of them would say we don't agree with you and we've excommunicated you we break communion with you you're out of the orthodox church and we're just now going to um and most likely uh there would just be another patriarch of constantinople that would be uh elected this has happened over and over before <laughs> we've already been through this You've had cases where this is where we get Eastern Catholics from in mm -hmm. most cases, um, where you have Orthodox bishops and, in fact, entire communions uh, sometimes who say, hey, we're going into communion with Rome. OK, well, the rest say, "Nah, we're, we're not on board with that. And they just end up replacing those guys. And the the ones who go into communion with Rome, they end up becoming Eastern Catholic. You know? <laughs> and so and creating a sui juris church. Um, so we've had this before. But yeah, if the Patriarch of Constantinople did that, they would just break communion with him and elect a new Patriarch of Constantinople. Wow. So this raises a serious question of how could this ever be healed given their current structure? I don't think that they could ever heal the schism given their current structure. What's the one structure that could heal the schism? The papacy. That's yeah, the one thing that could. That's what that's what's so what's so difficult about that first objection is well Jesus is the head of the church not the pope. Well, first of all that distinction that you made visible invisible, but the practical realities of there not being a visible head of the church prevents a lot of things, doesn't it Michael? It's it right. it it really opens the door to a lot of difficulty because it it, it kind of reminds me of the Protestant objection to Catholicism that says well, I don't need the authority of the church. I just have the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And it, it's because now important. I get to just, that means whatever I think it means. It leads to chaos. They'll, of course, say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit is guiding us at that le level. But yeah, look, a, a Protestant says the same thing. <laughs> you know, right. uh, I we, we don't need one head pastor. The Holy Spirit guides us all as elders here. And, and it's kind of the... It's the same problem. Okay, well, if there isn't that one visible head, then this if there's a massive agreement, then this body of elders is going to break away into schism in smaller groups. You know, there has to be that visible structure at the end of the day that has the authority to bind consciences. And uh, they don't have that. Well, I like how in your in your chapter on this, you know, you you do a, you give a lot of quotes from church fathers and from the councils themselves and you, you make a quote on page 27 from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who's my confirmation saint, and he's talking about the local bishop. He says he is not only a symbol of Christ. Through him, the presence of the body is real in the community. I beseech you, writes Ignatius of Antioch about the year 100, seek to do all things in divine harmony under the presidency of the bishop who has the place of God at your meeting. You know, mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that that's, that's such a powerful thing to connect this to to the way that Christ has set things up as in terms of his, his authority, but to make the statement that the Pope is not the head of the church, Jesus at a church. I think, I think those are two distinct sentences there. You could say, well, the Pope's not the head of the church, but then you have to provide an alternative to who is the visible head of the church. And, and they're not doing that. Not in any, any way they can, they can agree on. You know, yeah. again, some some will say an ecumenical council or a pan orthodox synod, but but then we 
we get into all kinds of problems what constitutes one and they tried to have again they haven't had an ecumenical council in 1300 years uh and that's because they neither have a pope nor an emperor and then number two um if they say a pan-orthodox synod the problem with that is okay the last one that they attempted to have um they had to call for over a hundred years it, it took mm -hmm. over a hundred years to call the thing and organize it and then it completely belly flopped and the reason why is because some of the orthodox did not want to come to the table uh for discussion with the other orthodox because they had problems with them so a lot of the churches didn't show up because they have problems with some of the other churches so they couldn't even come to the table um let alone come to an agreement well, in part two, I think that that leads to the historical things, because, I mean, we could we could talk all day long about why the Pope is the visible head of the church and and all of these things. Um, but it, ultimately, it's going to come down to this issue is that, like you mentioned in the beginning and you talk about a lot in this book. And I find this is kind of the main theme of your book is you point out where Orthodox sources have taught these things in the past pre-schism. So we have to come to the reality that the the church had these views mm -hmm. and that everyone was on the same page with them to a certain degree so to then pretend that these are innovative heretical views put forth by rome it is just not historically accurate so pointing back to some of these historical things like the, your first one in the historical attacks the eastern churches in the first millennium never accepted papal infallibility you know that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you how do you handle that in this book? Yeah, well, I would I would point to the Six Ecumenical Council as one among multiple examples, but that one's probably my favorite. Here you have Pope Agatho writing to the Emperor, uh, and in this letter he teaches papal infallibility, and that letter is then read at the Six Ecumenical Council, and the fathers hear the 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 papal letter teaching papal infallibility they accept it they write back to the pope saying they accept it they love it they're on fire for the letter and everything in it um and it teaches the doctrine of papal infallibility and they didn't say hey this is heresy no they, they accepted it um in fact agatho mentions how the see of saint peter uh is indefectible and to use his words he says undefiled unto the end so not just up until that time but unto the end and undefiled in what sense in matters of faith and morals it has never erred from the apostolic teachings or the apostolic faith so he's talking about teachings faith and morals and it will be undefiled unto the end based on what well, based on the promise of Jesus that Jesus made to Peter when he said, uh, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I pray that your faith fail not. And then he applies that to the successors of Peter, specifically in Rome. And he says they will be undefiled unto the end. Um, and again, they accept that. Um, so now there's a whole nother discussion on how that works with the issue with Honorius, which only works in favor of Catholicism, not Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah, uh, go so into that a little bit because yeah. that's honestly that's one of those things that even even Protestants will bring up as you know the as sort of like the kryptonite to Catholicism and their views in the papacy. Ah, oh, well, didn't you have a heretical pope who you know was mm. teaching heresy and then was declared a heretic? And mm. doesn't that disprove the claims of papal infallibility? Let's you know talk about that for a few minutes. I'm I'm all too happy when an Orthodox brings up Honorius because they think it's a slam dunk against Catholicism, and actually it's a slam dunk against them. They just haven't figured it out yet. Um, so I'm really happy when they bring it up because I like to turn the tables on them with this. So let's do that briefly. You have the fathers at the Six Ecumenical Council not only accepting papal infallibility with this letter of Agatho, but in the letter of Agatho, it specifically mentions, Agatho mentions how all of his predecessors <clears throat> were undefiled and have never strayed from the apostolic faith. All of his predecessors. Well, who's one of his predecessors? Honorius, right? Okay. And he says, every one of them undefiled Council fathers accept that. They don't object to that. Now, several sessions later, kind of, um, they don't really debate and have a huge discussion about Honorius. It's just kind of thrown in there at the end of a different situation. Uh, the name of Honorius is thrown in as, um, as a heretic, and he's anathematized. Um, 
and they accuse him of being a, a monothelite. Well, um, are they contradicting themselves? Well, here's the problem. If they're contradicting themselves, let's say they're saying in one session, yeah, all the predecessors of Agatha, they're, they're not heretics. Oh, wait, we made a mistake. Honorius is a heretic, right? Let's say that's the scenario. Here's the problem with that. Aside from the fact that, again, they're contradicting themselves within the same ecumenical council, um, I would also point out that they accepted that Honorius and all of the other predecessors of Agatha were undefiled precisely because of the promise that Jesus made to St. Peter. That is a doctrinal claim. That's a doctrinal evaluation. They're saying that Honorius is, um, uh, has not taught heresy precisely because of this doctrine. Now, if they now change it, and they're saying that he did teach heresy in his magisterium, they're contradicting the doctrine that they already accepted. So now we have a problem. They would be violating their own doctrine. And if that's the case, upon what basis should I ever consider their Christological doctrines? <laughs> if you don't get ecclesiology right, you reject your own doctrine, and you're changing your own doctrine. Why would I care what you have to say about Jesus and Jesus in his two wills? If you can't get ecclesiology right, I can't trust your Christology. So this, this would destroy the credibility of the council. So I don't think that that's an acceptable answer. So we then have to ask, okay, well, how can we harmonize this without them contradicting themselves? Here's how. And it works for Catholics, but it doesn't work for Orthodox. For Catholics, I could point out they accepted papal infallibility, and they accepted that even Honorius never taught heresy. However, in a later session... They accuse him of being a uh, heretic, and I would say they are keeping in mind the distinction between the Pope teaching heresy versus just simply being a heretic in his private person. I could, I, as a Catholic, you could say a Pope could be in a state of material heresy. You know, he he might not realize that he he holds to a heresy, uh, but that doesn't mean that he's taught it in his magisterium. There's a fundamental difference there. So in other words, from the Catholic perspective, I would understand that in one session, they accept papal infallibility and they accept that nobody, no popes have ever taught heresy. In a later session, they come back and they evaluate the situation and they conclude that, okay, well, no, Pope Honorius didn't teach heresy in his magisterium, but he was a heretic in his private person. Um, <clears throat> so in his private judgments. That's the only way to really reconcile this thing. Unless you just, again, say that they contradicted themselves uh, or the, you deny that they accepted papal infallibility. And those just simply don't work with the historical record. Um, so, again, this works in favor of Catholicism, not Eastern Orthodoxy. I'll, I'll also briefly add that they did make an uh, error in judgment about um, about Honorius because he did not actually hold to monothelitism, even in his private person. Now, we know that ecumenical councils can err in matters of fact, not in matters of faith and morals. Uh, so they were not violating faith and morals and contradicting themselves and making themselves unreliable in their Christological teachings because I would say their faith and morals were intact uh, and they did not contradict them. Uh, but did they make a poor evaluation historically and factually about Honorius and his private person, yes, because the historical record shows he did not hold the monothelitism. It also shows this if you look at one of the successors of Honorius, Pope John IV, wrote an apology, a defense for him. So did Maximus the defense, uh, Maximus the Confessor, highly venerated in the East. He also defended that Honorius was an heretic. Well, Pope John IV writes a defense for Honorius, showing that he wasn't. Um, uh, did not hold to uh, monothelitism. And one of the arguments that he points to is the guy who wrote down the letters for Pope Honorius, where he supposedly, uh, you know, uttered these heresies, the guy who writes the letters said, hey, no, he, he did not mean monothelitism by this. Here's what he did mean. And it was a perfectly orthodox understanding. Um, and so the very people who knew Honorius even wrote down his letters knew this is not what he meant. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 pretty established at this point that he he actually wasn't a, a monothelite. So I, you know, I'm not an expert in Pope Honorius or all this kind of stuff. But what what I thought I read a while back was that 
the issue with him wasn't anything that he did. It was how he didn't respond to what somebody else had said. He didn't like correct someone or he didn't um, respond in a way that someone who was a heretic had put forth something. There is that direction that some people take it. There's a little pushback that can be offered where people will point out that, you know, there's language in the council that he shared in their error, not that he merely was negligent, but he, that he shared in the error of these other heretics who were monothelites. Um, so some might point to that kind of language and say it's more than just a mere negligence. Uh, but the language of negligence does come from Pope Leo II, who's the one who ended up ratifying the Sixth Ecumenical Council. So some will argue, well, that's how he understood it. Again, others will push back on it and appeal to other things that Leo said. So my whole point is, let's just go ahead and for the sake of argument, concede the worst situation here, <laughs> that, that even Leo II was ratifying a view that he wasn't just negligent, but that he actually held uh, to monothelitism and somehow in his private personal person uh confirmed this error but the issue was that but the the accusation wasn't that he formally taught that heresy the accusation was that he held heretical views privately is that right yeah. right i don't see any evidence that he formally taught it in his magisterium or that that's how leo understood it right um and if it is i would then say okay now we have a a, a fundamentally um uh, um, a massive fundamental problem here because I would say if he, if Leo II was ratifying the view that Pope Honorius did formally teach heresy in his magisterium, then again, the prior session that teaches that all of the uh, popes did not teach uh, heresy formally in their magisterium based on this divine promise of Jesus Christ, that has now been falsified. That and, makes sense and, to me. Yeah. And, and I would say at that point, okay, well, you have a falsification event here taking place at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which now means both Catholicism is false and Eastern Orthodoxy is false. Both of them are knocked out, not just one, both of them are destroyed. Six Ecumenical Council is gone, and anybody who holds to it is gone. What's left? Uh, some Anglicans, some Lutherans, some Protestants, some Oriental Orthodox, some Assyrian Church of the East. Christian. No, man, you're you're forgetting it, man. The the, the KJV Baptists were the one, that was St. Paul's KJV, Bible. KJV. Dude. <laughs> uh, what's left? Well, certainly not Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. They're not left after that. Wow, that's 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 really helpful to understand that because that argument gets brought forth. I've heard that argument before, but to make the distinction between what. He was being accused of, but also that that baseline argue, that baseline statement that all of the successors or the predecessors of, of Agatho were faithful. Yeah, that sets the stage for whatever comes next. Yeah, that's yeah. like defining. That's like the defining um, foundation for what we're going to then say. And, that if, and if they falsely, because of a factual error, claim that Honorius was a heretic, which you're saying has been called into question later then that's a different thing completely than saying that a pope has formally taught heresy. Correct. Because yeah. I, I can, let's say somehow there's conclusive proof that Honorius privately did hold to monothelitism. That doesn't destroy the claims that were made about the papacy. Because right, the because he would have had to have taught that. Exactly. formally yeah which, yeah, I, which we, we no can one's say, saying that yeah I, exactly we can hold that a pope is privately a heretic that that doesn't destroy any of the claims yet. okay that's very helpful okay let's let's move on to part three mm -hmm. um let's talk about the liturgical attacks and i i think you know there's a lot of, of a lot of different things here you know talking about the unleavened bread the clown masses which you know that 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 argument is just ridiculous anyway <laughs> because you know you don't hold up the 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 abuse of something as the standard of that and argue against that. But, right. you know, I, I think, I think the, the biggest overall idea that I think people run into with orthodoxy is when they're going to take is we're going to, they're going to take the liturgical, the, the liturgical innovations in Catholicism or developments in Catholicism, however you want to talk about that. I mean, there's no, nobody's arguing that the, the way that Catholics have celebrated their liturgy has never changed in all of the years. Like no one makes that claim. Even the people that that refer to the TLM as the mass of the ages, which I that's what I go to. I love it. But nobody's making that claim 
Well, I shouldn't say nobody. That I've heard people make the claim that Jesus <laughs> that the Last Supper was a TLM, right? I've um, heard that before. Well, <laughs> I think I think most, most people don't would, make that would make the, the, the distinction of how that <laughs> yeah. developed and has changed over the years. Yeah. I mean, I've had people plenty plenty of people say things like, "Well, Paul V declared there can be absolutely no changes made, and this and that, and look what all." I mean, I, I get all that, but at the end of the day, Eastern Orthodoxy seems to have this this as a as as a one up on Catholicism they say look our divine liturgy has never changed we've never altered a thing it's the same and you got you catholics keep messing with everything and look at your mass and look at your ridiculous modern churches with your goofy music and your your felt banners and all that kind of and then of course the clown masses i mean come on that's not right look at look at we've maintained the purity of our of our liturgy here you know so this and I think honestly, that is the, the right now. I think that is a more a f- powerful argument because that's real life for Catholics. A lot of Catholics are, are are feeling that personally. They're not real Catholics every day. Aren't sitting around worried about about you know what happened at the Sixth Ec- Ecumenical Council. They're they're thinking about what they are going through when they go to Mass on Sunday. And when an Eastern Orthodox person comes along and says, "Look, why are you dealing with all this?" wackiness in your, you know, your modern church, when you can just come back to the way it's always supposed to have been, that can sound very appealing. I think that's what you went through to a certain degree. So Mm -hmm. speak to that. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's something that has a lot of emotional and rhetorical force, right? Uh, Especially if we're dissatisfied with some liturgical abuses and then we go and see a really awesome, you know, divine liturgy or something like that. Um, well, I'd point out a, a, a couple things here. Num- number one, if abuses of a liturgy is somehow your standard, then don't go to Eastern Orthodoxy because in Eastern Orthodoxy, you're going to constantly see the sacrilege of rebaptism. And that's exactly what it is, according to St. Vincent of Lorenz, the church father. Um, they often rebaptize people, not all, not, not all Eastern Orthodox, but many of them now, rebaptize. Uh, converts. So, uh, in other words, if you let's say you have a Roman Catholic who's thinking about going to Eastern Orthodoxy, and uh, you know, obviously they've received all of the sacraments of initiation. Well, some Eastern Orthodox consider this Roman Catholic to be a pagan. They don't even consider him to be a baptized Christian, and so they'll rebaptize him. They won't consider it rebaptism. They'll say this is the first baptism kind of thing, um, and so that's massively sacrilegious. Uh, however, other Orthodox won't rebaptize, but then some of the ones who would receive you without rebaptizing you, uh, some of the other Orthodox wouldn't even consider them to be Orthodox. So there's a massive problem here. So again, abuses of liturgy should not be your standard here because you're going to end up with all kinds of problems in Orthodoxy. But um, you will find some Orthodox who kind of use these arguments with this kind of rhetorical and emotional force to it. And again, it reminds me of you know some catholics who think that the first liturgy was a tlm or some protestants who think the first bible was a kjv it's in that category right yeah um but those are the minority you know i i I think you're more educated orthodox and know better than to employ this argument um but you know a lot of people online you'll 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 kind of see it there um those are some of my thoughts on on the matter i don't know if you wanted to get more specific with it though well, I think I think it's just sort of a general mm-hmm. frame of argument from it's and and I I categorize it as like a cheap shot. It you is know, to say, oh well, you you know you ridiculous Catholics with your clown masses come back to the the you know whatever, and and at the same time, we have to we have to be cognizant as Catholics if we do the same thing to Protestants, you know. We can we can say, well, come on, all of you goofy Protestants with your rock concerts and your, you know, um, cl- dancing bears and all that kind of stuff like that, and 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 all of that come to the true worship of Catholicism. It's almost like that's that there may be elements of truth to that, but it's probably not the best way to to demonstrate the his the historicity and truth of the Catholic faith is to attack an experience versus to make a truth claim. But, oh, I, I but it's an attack that we have to deal with from 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 Eastern Orthodox. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Because you know, not all Protestants have those kinds of 
liturgies. Some of them have, you know, more structured and more reverent liturgies than that. And so, yeah, it's it's not very helpful. I, I, I think that it's more important to stick to the things that are objectively true, objective truth claims. So um, here's my response to the emotional uh, liturgical appeals. I would just point out which church did Christ establish? That is the one that you need to be a part of abuses or not, because you find, for instance, in the Old Testament, God obviously uh, establishes his covenant uh, with a particular group of people and then also, uh, you know, orders a particular structure of their liturgy. Now, there were plenty of liturgical abuses in the Old Testament. You can read about them in the Old Testament. Does that somehow falsify <clears throat> the covenant of God, the truth of the worship of Yahweh, uh, the truth of his religion? Does that somehow mean that we can now go and worship Baal because we have liturgical abuses with the cult of Yahweh? No. Um, an abuse is just that. It's an abuse. But that doesn't negate which, which community and which God we need to be worshiping here. Um, likewise, um, just because you might have abuses within Catholicism doesn't negate which community we need to be a part of. Um, so again, if this was true in the Old Testament, it's also true now. Um, the more fundamental question has to be, which church did Christ establish? That's the one I need to be a part of, and that's where I will um, address the issue of liturgical abuse within that context. In the exact same way that if I were living 3,000 years ago, I would have addressed the issue and dealt with the issue of liturgical abuse within the covenant of the worship of Yahweh. I would not have gone to a covenant with Baal. <laughs> right? Yeah, because you might be able to say, hey, the, the, those those priests of Baal are are more reverent to their idol than, right. than these yeah. disobedient priests of Yahweh. So does that make yeah. their religion right? Yeah, yeah, these priests of Baal are more devoted to their cult of Baal. Look at them cutting and slitting their wrists for their God, while you have these other followers of Yahweh worshiping all kinds of other gods instead of Yahweh. And so look at how more committed the Baal worshipers are. And so it doesn't follow that you need to now go to Baal worship likewise. Now, obviously, there's a fundamental difference between Yahweh worship and Baal worship versus worshiping Yahweh within Catholicism versus Orthodoxy. Obviously, the point of the analogy, however, is the covenant community that Christ established is fully within the Catholic Church. It is not fully within Eastern Orthodoxy. So when we get those attacks against our our liturgy, you know, I think there are, there may be things that we can learn from that and say, yeah, we need to do a better job with that. <laughs> but to to concede that the that the liturgy has has developed over two thousand years does not therefore in any way um, give ground to the attacks against the papacy. Yeah, and doctrinal developments and and liturgical developments are 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 things that we see, and yeah. there, and there was never a promise that there would be one liturgy passed down that would be maintained for out all time and place. Well, and let me add to that. The Byzantine liturgy has developed. <laughs> so we, we can't fight against liturgical development in, in the Roman Rite without then, again, applying the same standard to the Byzantine liturgy, uh, which, which, again, is very much developed. And in fact, there were at one point other liturgies, uh, but then those were suppressed, and then the Byzantine liturgy was imposed on them. And so... Um, there's uh there's that difficulty within Eastern Orthodoxy as well because they they all just celebrate the Byzantine liturgy. They don't have, you know, in the way that we in Catholicism have 24 uh, churches and we have various kinds of liturgies. They don't have that. They just have the Byzantine liturgy. That's it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because the Byzantine liturgy supplanted some of their other Eastern liturgies, and again, it has undergone development. You might argue, well, it doesn't have as many developments as the Latin right. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, how many developments, you know, do you have a particular amount of number to like determine like what's one development too many? Um, the kinds of developments we're talking about are not substantial in nature on, on both sides. So like, okay, do you have a number for how many accidental developments is no longer allowed? I mean, 
<laughs> seems yeah. a little arbitrary. At that I think point. I think of all of the attacks that are that are that, are, that come from from Eastern Orthodox, that's probably the the least interesting one. Um, but it's it's also at the same time one you hear probably the most. It's the most um, persuasive rhetorically and emotionally, and yet it's it probably is. the least yeah. in intellectual argument. It's well. Over. Well put. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking time to join us here on Catholic Feedback. And there's a lot more we can get into. So I just want to encourage everybody, if, if this is interesting to you and, and you and you don't want to spend, you know, six months reading a book, grab this book. This is a I mean, it's it's not meant to be the exhaustive, all encompassing, you know, deep dive into every single aspect of every argument. This is meant to give you as a Catholic just a basic understanding when these attacks come at you from from those within Eastern Orthodoxy that want to try to persuade you to leave the Catholic faith, this is going to give you just enough to say, all right, let's, let's really think about this. And we have some answers. Um, so I would just recommend that There's a, there'll be a link in the description to this book, which is published through Catholic answers, which is awesome that they're doing that. And the book's doing great. You were telling me earlier today, it's, it's, it's been doing very well. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And, um, thank you. thank you for all your work. Where can people find out more about you if they don't already know, uh, where, yeah. Great place to go is just go to YouTube, type in Reason and Theology, and you'll uh, you'll see me there, or just reasonandtheology.com. Yeah, and make sure you you subscribe and check that out. Michael's always got a lot of interesting things to say, and and um, just just a, a great way to to think about these issues. So, Michael, thank you again for hanging out with me today, and and hopefully I can get back down to to where you are. It's a lot warmer down there than what I'm dealing with. I can tell you. I that don't right know. Right. It's cold right now. So I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean to you? What is <laughs> yeah, cold? No, right? Uh, well, it's right now in the room, it's 66 degrees. That's cold for me. I don't know. Okay. Well, what is it outside? Uh, it's probably 50. Oh, you know? pfft. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cry me a river. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, listen, Michael, thank you so much for taking time to be here, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, all the rest of you, for watching us here on Catholic Feedback. And until next time, we look forward to getting together to connect the eternal truths of the Catholic faith to everyday life, my friends. Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you back here next time. Thanks for listening to Catholic Feedback with Keith Nestor. Send in your questions and comments to feedback at catholicfeedback.com. This podcast is brought to you by Stewardship, a mission of faith, and is also supported by our team at patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor. Please consider joining our support team. Catholic Feedback is a production of Down to Earth Ministries. For more information about Down to Earth or to bring me to your parish or event, visit down the number 2 earthministry.org see you next time